Good evening, everybody. We are here with another presentation of the uh, 2024 presentation series. And tonight we are here with Mara Reed on the power of continuous long-term hydrothermal monitoring. And we will go ahead and kick it right All right, thank you, Will. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a PhD candidate over at University of California, Berkeley. I mainly consider myself a geophysicist most of the time. Um, I've been here since 2018, so I'm slowly getting to the end of my career in graduate school. And I'm also a geyser gazer, but when I'm not thinking about geysers, I like caving, I like photography. Sometimes those two things get combined, sometimes not, and just generally hiking and being outside. So here's a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, just in case there are any students in the audience, I wanted to talk just a little bit about how I went from being a gazer to a grad student researcher. We're going to talk a little bit about what hydrothermal monitoring is currently going on at Norris Geyser Basin. And then I'm going to move on to talk about two current research pro projects that I'm working with. One is on earthquakes in geysers. Specifically, there might have been an earthquake-triggered geyser uh, eruption at Steamboat in 2022. And then finally, we'll do um, research on disturbances that have been happening in the last decade. So I do have my phone to the side of me, and I am looking at the chat. So if you find that I don't explain something very well, or you just have a question that you think should be answered sooner rather than later, if you pop it into the chat, I will probably see it in my peripheral vision. But if I don't, if I miss it, or you can also ask it at the end. OK. So I got into geysers as a wee middle schooler. and didn't quite figure out that you need to have long sleeves and long pants in Yellowstone at this time. You'll see by the mid-teens, I figured out the long pants, but not quite the long sleeves yet. So this was sort of the time when the almost and current 20-somethings were gallivanting around the geyser basin. So that's really when I got into gazing, is running around with those folks in the picture there. And then finally, to feed my geyser obsession, I transitioned into working in the park in the summer. Strangely, this is the only photo I could find of myself actually in my work uniform. Why I'm stuffing a bunch of marshmallows in my face, I don't know. So at first, as I transitioned more into college, I knew I wanted to go to grad school, but I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to study. For a while, I was really gearing towards astrophysics and especially solar physics. But I had some early research experiences that um, kind of shifted my trajectory a little, a little bit. In 2015, I wrote up a permit proposal, which would become the GOSA Sawmill Group Monitoring Study, and I was involved with that project. I also had a 2016 geophysics internship based at Boise State, where I was working with active seismic experiments. And both of those experiences really sort of pushed me towards earth sciences and made me think, hmm, Actually, I might want to do some geyser research. So when I was applying to grad schools, it was pretty easy. Not many people do geyser research, so I think I applied to like three programs and I ended up landing at UC Berkeley. At first, I was sort of flailing around, didn't know what exactly I wanted to focus on. I just knew that I wanted to do field work, not be in the lab. So I joined on some USGS and National Park Service projects. Here are some photos from my first ever field work trip in Yellowstone. I got to work on things that I didn't think I would be, including how hydrothermal activity affects trees and jumping into the would-be pit toilet vault at the Ferry Falls trailhead to look at center deposition rates because it's really hard to get a permit to dig anywhere in Yellowstone. So when development projects do the digging for you, you want to get in there to see what's going on. So since then, I've sort of figured out what grad school is going to be all about for me, and I've continued to do more fieldwork excursions. It's really a privilege to go into Yellowstone. We do our work in November and April when the park is closed to visitors, so you get wonderful views of the Geyser Basin. It's very peaceful and quiet. But on the flip side, it's the time of chaotic weather where one day you might be in a short sleeve shirt, 
and then the next day it's snowing and the equipment that you left is now buried in snow so you got to trudge through the snow unbury your equipment and by the time you're ready to leave your footprints have already been covered back in so well, I don't want to discourage anyone from doing what I did and essentially making my hobby my job, it does kind of change your relationship to what you do. This was made very clear to me. So on my first fieldwork trip, we were passing down by the giant cage. And I noticed Bijou was off. And I also noticed that the platform just sounded weird. If I was there geyser gazing, I probably would have plopped myself down and waited for a while just to see if anything would happen. But we had more work to do. We went down basin, grabbed some water samples. We futzed with the temperature logger over at Riverside's Cone. And then the sun was setting at that point, and we were ready to start heading home. And of course, we round the Riverside Bend, and there is this view that greets us. I probably screamed something unintelligible and ran towards the boardwalk. Everybody else kept to the bike path, and one of my colleagues snapped this photo of me alone at Giant. This remains the only Giant eruption that I've ever seen, but I could only stay for a few minutes because we weren't there for fun. We were there for research. So sort of being a geyser researcher has changed my relationship to geysers a little bit, and that now when I come in for fun when I'm not doing field work, I spend a lot more time just kind of enjoying sitting and watching, and I don't think about data during those times as much as I used to. So just a real quick overview of kind of the different things I'm doing now. My dissertation is very focused on Steamboat Geyser and Norris Geyser Basin. Steamboat's active phase began in 2018. I began my PhD in 2018. That lined up really well. But other than that, I'm also involved with projects with other people, some of the interesting things include working on a low-cost video system for imaging geyser conduits. That's actually what I'm holding in that photo there. Um, understanding thumping hot springs and geysers, that's work with the University of Utah. And then also using trees as a monitoring tool for hydrothermal activity, and that's with the USGS. But today, I am mostly just going to focus on these last two, which are both work that's ongoing for me. Okay. Let's transition into actually talking about science and hydrothermal monitoring. First, I want to outline a sort of report card for physical geyser monitoring. And when I say physical, I mean not chemical. So we'll put the geochemical sampling aside for a second. At short time scales, so we're talking seconds to days, you can learn things about eruption dynamics, what's going on underground, what plumbing systems looks like, and how geysers respond to weather. And in this realm, as a geyser research community, we're doing pretty great. Especially in the last decade or so, there's been more studies that actually put pressure and temperature sensors into geysers and hot springs, as well as microphones and video cameras. There are also seismic experiments and infrasound monitoring experiments, as well as other geophysical methods like using tilt meters and electrical methods. And then also just using surface video and infrared imagery to get at how um, geysers jet, how high they're going, that sort of thing. So then at the time scale of weeks to months, where you learn things about variations, eruption, and subsurface dynamics, how geysers respond to seasonal drivers like the hydrologic cycle, we're doing good to just okay. A lot of the more famous geysers tend to get repeat short-term campaigns by the same research group or maybe different research groups. Um, runoff temperature sensors are getting you monitoring in this time scale. And there have been a handful of longer term seis seismic studies that keep seismometers out for a few months at a time. A uh, notable one of that is there's now been a study done over in Iceland at Stroker Geyser that's actually collected a catalog of tens of thousands of eruptions. But, and that seismometer was only there for a little bit under a year, I believe. Okay. Finally, getting to long time scales, that's years to decades. As a research community, we're not doing so great. This is when you can learn about things uh, about changing intervals over time, what drives dormancy, reactivation of geysers, and how they respond to earthquakes and climates in humans. In Yellowstone, there's only one geyser basin with permanent sensors, and we'll talk about that. That's an Oris geyser basin. A lot of other areas have monitoring equipment, but especially in the last few years, the data is not being published, so there's just not a lot available. 
And then elsewhere in the world, if people are doing any sort of long-term monitoring of geysers, they certainly are not publishing papers about it. So for anyone unfamiliar kind of with the geyser basins of Yellowstone, Norris Geyser Basin is located just north of the caldera rim. All the red you see here are different hydrothermal areas. Most of them you see are inside the caldera. Norris is a bit weird by being just outside. And this is why I say it is super well monitored. So there's a network of temperature loggers. Those are those yellow squares you see. Those are maintained by the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. That's a consortium of the USGS and some other government agencies and universities. So one of them measures air temperature, that's at Newfar Lake. And then the others are placed in runoff channels or pools. So this centrally located green triangle, we've also got seismic data. This is broadband seismometer YNM. You might be familiar with those three letters if you've been watching Steamboat the last few years. That's the primary seismometer people are using to pick up steamboat eruptions. There's an additional seismometer about two kilometers to the southeast. That's code YNR. There's also a GPS station over there. And new as of just September last year, we now have another seismometer inside Norris, as well as an infrasound sensor. So infrasound, that just means a fancy microphone that picks up low frequency noise. There is also a weather and GPS station over there, but as far as I know, that data has not been made public yet. Although last I heard, there are plans that that data should be made public. And then finally, off the map into the north, there is a stream gauge also operated by the USGS on Tantalus Creek. So Tantalus Creek is interesting because basically this is almost a completely thermally fed stream. So 90% of all the water coming out of the geysers and the hot springs and everything else in Norris is going into this creek. So if you measure the stream flow through this creek, you get an idea of the aggregate stream flow, thermal flow out of the basin. Okay, just as a brief aside, all of the data that I just talked about is publicly accessible, and I wanted to throw a few slides up here for you to reference later if you want to check this out. So the temperature data, you can get two places. The first is on the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory website. That'll get you to graphs for the past day, week, or month of data. If you want to go back farther than that, for a few of the loggers for constant steamboat nakinus, you can go to geysertimes.org, and that'll be in the data loggers section. For Tantalus stream flow, the USGS also has a website for that. You can go ahead and uh, select whatever time window you want and plot discharge and temperature. For seismic data, those instruments are maintained by the University of Utah. If you want to see a day plot, so that's uh, seismic data for the last 24 hours, you can go directly to the University of Utah website and click on any station on the map and view the live seismogram. But if you want an archive day plot for a certain day, there's an individual who does that on isthisthingon.org. And finally, if you're a programmer, you can also use the OBSPY package to look at seismic data. This is what I use to do a lot of my seismic analysis. And they have a great tutorial. And even for me, who is terrible at coding, I find it very straightforward. Last but not least, we have the GPS data. So these are maintained by a few different organizations, but they are all collected together on the USGS website. There's a continuous network, so that means permanent stations that are always there. Um, there's also the semi-permanent stations that go out in the summer and then get taken down for the winter. And then you can access both of those through this website. Okay. Back from our data aside, let's kind of refresh our memories on what Steamboat Geyser is all about. So of course, this has been the star of Norris Geyser Basin for the last several years. What I've plotted on the bottom here is cumulative eruptions since 1960. So with the caveat that this data comes from geyser times, which undercounts some of the eruptions in the 1960s for when we don't have a good handle on what date eruptions actually occurred, even though we knew they may have happened, just nobody was there. So you'll notice here that eruptions are clustered into active phases. So we have the 60s active phase, the 80s active phase, and what's started now since 2018. 
You'll also notice that even between active phases, the kind of individual one-off eruptions also cluster together. So us experiencing this active phase has really highlighted what the monitoring network at Norris can do. Steamboat has eruptions that are picked up in the seismic data, in the Tantalus stream flow data, and also in a runoff temperature sensor data that's placed near Steamboat. So unfortunately for people who want to see Steamboat in this active phase, it does seem like it might be on the way towards winding down. Since about mid-2021, roughly, we've started to have more longer intervals. There was a 65-day interval in 2021. And then we have this really long, just 15 minutes shy of 90-day interval on before the 18 September 2022 eruption. And what was kind of weird about this eruption is that there was a moderate earthquake. So this is in relation to what seismicity normally is in Yellowstone. A moderate earthquake about 11 kilometers to the northwest of Steamboat. And that occurred just eight hours and 15 minutes before that major eruption. So there was an observer, Mark Wolf, who headed out to Steamboat right after the earthquake hit and didn't note anything weird going on but we still had that major eruption. So there's a low probability of this being a coincidence, but because it's such an outlier interval, in even recent intervals, we haven't gotten up to 90 days again. So that sort of complicates any probability analysis that you can do, but it's compelling enough to take a closer look. So first, can earthquakes affect geysers? Yes, and the short answer is we're sort of still working out the details as to why and how the same earthquake can affect geysers so differently. But we do know that earthquakes both near and far can trigger eruptions, although most of our documentation of this comes from large earthquakes. In the Yellowstone area in the last few decades, there have been three major earthquakes. In 1959, the big Hebgen Lake earthquake, which seemed like it caused most geysers to erupt pretty much as soon as the earthquake hit. There were also the 1975 Yellowstone earthquake and the 1983 Bora Peak earthquake, both of which changed features, but not quite as um, dramatically as the Hebgen Lake earthquake did. So below this map of these earthquake locations, there's some plot of average intervals for Old Faithful. So if you look, especially at panel B, the black arrows are marking the timing of all these earthquakes, and you'll note that there is an increase in eruption interval for Old Faithful after lo lots of these uh, major earthquakes. And the interesting thing is that it seems like this change is pretty much permanent. The interval increases, and it doesn't return to pre the pre-earthquake state. So here's another example of a large earthquake, the 2002 Denali earthquake, except this was what we call a teleseismic earthquake, so just something that happened far away. Even so, there were some directivity effects that amplified ground shaking and dynamic stresses as they went by Yellowstone, so this actually triggered a lot of smaller earthquakes just in Yellowstone itself. And then we also know that it affected daisy geysers, so that's that first plot. So in, in average, the intervals, came down and they stayed at a lower level and they slowly recovered over months, which is not shown on this plot. But if you look at the intervals for Old Faithful, it doesn't look like there was any effect at all. So while we have sort of an idea of what's going on with these kind of larger earthquakes, and we roughly have a threshold that you need peak dynamic stresses of about 0.1 megapascal, to change things with geysers. And that corresponds to a peak ground velocity of one centimeters per second, which is a little bit easier to conceptualize. We still don't know a ton about what smaller but closer earthquakes do to geysers. So for this particular magnitude 3.9 earthquake that happened on September 18th, 2022, the peak ground velocity as calculated at YNM, and that's just 330 meters north of Steamboat, so it'll probably be pretty similar at the two locations. They were about, that, that was about 1 to 2, 1.2 centimeters per second. So we are above that threshold. The next question we sort of asked was, well, have any other earthquakes exceeded that 1 centimeter per second value during this Steamboat active phase? 
So what we did is we looked at earthquake catalogs and we compiled all the earthquakes occurring sort of in the region of Norris Geyser Basin that were above magnitude two. And we also looked at regional and teleseismic earthquakes above magnitude six. And then we calculated the peak ground velocity for all of these earthquakes. And that's what's plotted on here. So we tried to use YNM when it was online, but as you all probably know, it doesn't, it's not always online. Sometimes it's malfunctioning. So if YNM wasn't available, we went to YNR. There was a small period of time at early 2023 where unfortunately both seismometers were offline, so we couldn't do data analysis for there, but that's a pretty small percentage of this whole time period. But as you can see, there's only this magnitude 3.9 that actually exceeds this one centimeters per second value. Interestingly enough, the next highest peak ground velocity occurred just on the next the day later on 19th September, but it was from a teleseismic earthquake and it didn't seem to have any effect. So we know at least during this active phase, there wasn't a greater peak ground velocity, which makes this even more compelling. But unfortunately, we do know that before this active phase, there were definitely were earthquakes that had a large peak ground velocity. There was a magnitude, I think, 4.8 earthquake in 2014. Of course, Steamboat did erupt later that year, but not for a few months, so probably wasn't related. So how can we dig into this question more to try and figure out, okay, did this earthquake actually trigger this eruption? So we can look at the available data um, elsewhere for surface activity. So that's looking at um, both the Tantalus Creek discharge data and we also have data for whirligig geyser eruptions. So we know that there weren't any visual reports of unusual activity around this time, at least nothing that people decided they wanted to share with geyser times. Uh, most of the temperature loggers, we didn't see any unusual signals there. We don't think there was a change to whirligig, so it's plotted in panel A here. In the lighter orange color, that's the fraction of eruptions per day that are minors. And on the bottom, we have the mean interval, so for single days, for all of the eruptions that are actually detected by that logger. Some of them are missed. And then panel B, we have the regular to regular eruption interval, although we are calling it major to major interval in this paper to uh, decrease confusion for people for scientists who are a little bit more used to that terminology. Sorry, MA. So anyways, so here you see the black lines here. That is the timing of the earthquake. We don't see any real significant change. It looks like whirligig majors are becoming less frequent over time, but that trend sort of started before the earthquake, so we don't think there's anything there. We also looked at the Tantalus Creek data that's plotted in panel C and there wasn't any short, immediate, unusual signal. We don't see a long-term trend that deviates from what it was already doing. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of evidence of effects from other geysers, at least from what we can see on the surface. But the good news is that we can see sort of below the subsurface, in the subsurface, by using the seismic data. So geyser basins will generate seismic noise, kind of generally just call this hydrothermal tremor. This is either just noise from boiling, so bubbles nucleating and collapsing. It could also be resonant conduits. So below is a spectrogram of vertical velocity at YNM. So how to read a spectrogram. So on the x-axis, we've got time. On the y-axis, we've got frequency. So basically, if you look at data that pops out of a seismometer, it's a bunch of wiggles. So think really complicated sine wave. Um, through some Fourier analysis and other analysis techniques, you can pick apart those wiggles to wiggles with just one period, which relates to frequency. So this then shows you what signals are strongest and what frequency they are. So here on this plot, yellow, that's going to be a stronger signal. Purple, that's going to be a weaker signal. So what we see is this, let me put on this laser pointer. 
So what we see is this kind of very subtle step change at a pretty low frequency. We have this band around one hertz. The earthquake happens, which is this line here, and then suddenly it jumps up in frequency slightly, and it also gets a lot weaker. And this takes a few days to recover. So that's kind of interesting. We also see the same sort of step changes at higher frequencies that we're less confident that we know exactly what these signals are. They probably hydrothermally related, but we haven't dug as much into the higher frequency end of the spectrum. So here is especially one of those, that step change, you can also see it with this wide band here. All right, put that away. So all in all, was this eruption actually triggered by the earthquake? We think we have enough evidence to say probably yes, but with some caveats. So first, based on the eruption interval distribution, there's a low probability that the earthquake and the eruption occurred on the same day by chance. But again, this was a super long outlier interval, and a low probability does not mean impossible. Next, we've got our peak ground velocity is the greatest recorded in Norris Geyser Basin since Steamboat began its active phase in 2018. That's also exceeding the one centimeter per second response threshold that we know from what other Yellowstone geysers are doing in response to earthquakes. The caveats here are that stronger earthquakes have not triggered steamboat eruptions in the past. That includes the 2014 magnitude 4.8 earthquake that was nearby Norris Geyser Basin. And also the three really strong um, Hebgen Lake, Bora Peak, Yellowstone Park earthquakes. Those also didn't trigger eruptions. So this might suggest that a geyser's internal state matters for whether or not it can be triggered. So a hypothesis is that earthquakes might only affect steamboat when it is in an active phase. But the Bora Peak earthquake, that was 1983, that was during a steamboat active phase. So that would present a challenge to this hypothesis. It was near the end of the active phase, so it's possible Steamboat was already moving towards a less active regime, and that's why it didn't trigger an eruption, but we don't know for sure. Finally, despite a lack of known altered surface activity in other monitored geysers, the seismic data suggests that there is altered water flow in the underground hydrothermal system, but we don't have a good grasp on how and where the flow is changing. Okay, so let's step away from Steamboat for a moment, zoom out, and think about Norris Geyser Basin as a whole. That's right, we're talking about disturbances. This was, at least in the scientific literature, first coined as the widespread contemporaneous change. So usually this means increased boiling, turbidity, and sulfate to chloride ratios in hot springs, and then springs that are Neutral tend to get more acidic. It's also accompanied by sudden or unusual changes to geyser activity, and this whole event might last days or it might last weeks. Also, things that have been attributed to disturbances are a drop in thermal discharge, so that would uh, correlate to a drop in discharge in Tantalus Creek. And every once in a while, you get fracturing and new thermal features formed and increased ground temperatures, which can be hazardous to visitors, as we saw in 2003. So what's currently known about when and why these disturbances occur, most of this work has been led by USGS scientists Bob Fournier and Don White. In kind of the seminal USGS report on Norris Geyser Basin, professional paper 1456, there's a list of historic disturbance observations that have been compiled, and it was noted that they were always reported in the summer and the fall. A couple decades later, based on a lot of water chemistry monitoring, Bob Fournier hypothesized that maybe as you get towards summer and fall, the water table drops. The cold water table is hydraulically linked to the hydrothermal system, so that means pressure would decrease in the hydrothermal system, this is going to cause boiling, and that might alter flow enough that water from normally isolated, shallow, and acidic reservoirs enters upflow from the deeper neutral chloride reservoirs. This is probably also enough to dislodge some of the clay and the many clay layers underneath Norris, and that would explain your muddy springs. So this is a reasonable hypothesis, and this is sort of what we've thought disturbances are for a while now. 
And of course, if you go to Norris Geyser Basin or you read a paper that's about Norris Geyser Basin, you'll see references to this annual or seasonal disturbance. But they really haven't been tracked by non-Norris geysers in recent decades. And our scientific understanding so far is based on historic visual observations that have been heavily concentrated in the summer and the fall. So you get to that problem where, well, if you're only looking at one time of the year, you're only going to find this thing during one time of the year. And then the rest of what we know is pretty much just based on geochemical observations. So we have all this monitoring data now. Let's actually use it. So we talked to M.A. Bellingham, Norris Geyser Basin Extraordinaire, and we got a very helpful starting list. We also looked into what has been posted to Geyser Times, and as well as posts on the LIFSERB and in the Facebook group. And we focused on the period 2013 to 2022 because our seismic data starts in about 2013. We adopted our initial definition of what a disturbance was based on sort of a few indicator springs and geysers. This included emerald spring, which usually goes from clear to cloudy and boiling, whirligig geyser, which at least in the last several years has gone from erratic eruptions to more regular eruptions, and steamboat geyser, which it will go from frequent minor eruptions to more weak splashing, and now we know when it's active, the eruption intervals between major eruptions lengthen. So between the visual observations and the temperature logger data, especially from Steamboat and Whirligig, we identified 15 candidate disturbances. Guess what? They're occurring year-round. Intervals are something somewhere between 15 and 68 weeks apart with a median of 38 weeks. So now that we have all these candidates, we want to see if they line up with any signals in the monitoring data. So specifically, we're going to go back to looking at the Tantalus discharge data. Again, that's a proxy for total outflow from Norris thermal features, as well as the broadband seismic data from inside the basin, which is going to get at changes to hydrothermal tremor. OK, so first, here is 10 years of Tantalus Creek data. I've applied a seven-day low-pass filter to at least get cut down on some of the noise. So. Kind of general features you might see is that it's especially clear after 2018 that there is a seasonal cycle to this. Let me pull out my laser pointer again. So when I talk about seasonal, I'm kind of talking about this shape to the curve. And in between that, there's quite a lot of variation. With the low pass filter, hopefully we've taken out most of like the one day super heavy rain events, but that might still be picking up some precipitation events. So this might not all be due to thermal variation, but it's better than just the raw data. OK. Now let's get into the seismic data. So if you've ever worked with seismic data, you know that it takes up a lot of space. And 10 years of seismic data, even just for one station, is a lot of data. So we wanted some way to distill the data, and we ended up um, using what's called seismic spectral amplitude measurement. So you can sort of think of this as looking at seismic data, pulling out the strength of the seismic signal for individual frequency bands. So first, we are mostly interested in the lower frequencies, because that's where a lot of hydrothermal tremor from kind of like geyser basin wide, it sits in that frequency range. So we band pass filtered the data to those um, frequency bands of interest. And then what we did was compute the median absolute velocity for just the overnight data. As you saw from some of the spectrograms earlier, there's a lot of noise during the day, and we didn't want that to uh, kind of convolute the picture. So when you go through and calculate this, this is for the 1.5 to 2.5 hertz band. This is what you get. So immediately, kind of the big features that I'm seeing are all of these peaks. So this would be an increase in seismic noise, which might indicate like an increase in boiling or just potentially boiling is coming closer to the surface. So what's really fun is if you plot this with the timing of disturbances, they line up really well with those peaks. This kind of shocked me when I first put this all together. So uh, let's see. 
So we also see sometimes there is that drop in flow in Tantalus Creek, but other times it seems like maybe there isn't, or if it's there, it's a really weak effect. So that's still kind of a sometimes thing, it seems like, at least in this time period. Next thing I'm going to mark on here is when the steamboat active phase begins. And this is kind of an interesting delineation between what was going on before that started and what goes on after. So before, we have these really well-defined peaks in seismic noise at this frequency. Before steamboat starts, these peaks are larger. We're not, I'm not quite sure what exactly is causing these step changes. It could be instrument related. I haven't been able to dig too deep into the data there yet. Um, but if it's real, it kind of represents something that's a little bit more chaotic in the system. And then Seamboat starts and there's this big drop off in seismic noise amplitude. And then we have, we continue to have these peaks, but they're smaller. And we also seem to have disturbances that are lining up with features that don't even quite look like a peak. They're just clusters of slightly elevated noise. So maybe this um, indicates a weaker event. It also seems to me that in the Tantalus Creek discharge data, you can really see the drop off in discharge before this point. And afterwards, that's when the effect seems to get a little weaker. Okay, so we're looking at a really narrow frequency band in the seismic data here. Uh, let's see. That. If we go in and plot some spectrograms of what's going on in a bit of a wider frequency range, so this is from a disturbance in March 2019. So again, we've got days, so time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and greener, yellower means stronger signal. Purple means weaker signal. So here we sort of have this very clear onset. We have some gliding signals. On the low end, we have increased noise in sort of this two to almost five hertz band. So this is how most events seem to begin, not all of them. We go for another segment of four days of data. We get this super weird signal that starts oscillating in frequency. And we honestly don't know what this is. I'm speculating at the moment that this could be some resonating conduit or cavity that has some sort of changing water level. So if you think about musical instruments, your small, short instruments are much higher in pitch than your big, long instruments. So when you have water level changing in a tube or in a cavity, if you lower that water level, suddenly you have a shorter length of the conduit that's in touch with that water, which is boiling, probably causing it to resonate, and that will uh, lower your resonant frequency. So it might be just because of this changing water level, that's the kind of signal we're getting. But exactly where it is, we haven't gotten that far to try and locating where that signal is. Okay, the next disturbance was in July, really late July into August 2019. This is one of those ones that doesn't have that really well-defined peak. So here's another four days of data. Same deal, we're still plotting spectrograms. So the onset of this one is very subtle on the vertical component. And this uh, yellow signal up here is a steamboat eruption. It's a little bit more visible on the north component of the seismometer that something weird is going on at this time. Again, signals are kind of drifting, step changing in frequency, signals are coming in and out. Okay, back to the vertical component. Now we're going forward in time, August 2nd through August 5th. And we do see that subsurface vibrato sort of like signal coming back in, which is interesting. This does not happen during every disturbance, but it does happen during a lot of them. And so far I have not found this signal outside of a disturbance. Okay, so I'm still very much in the midst of this project. But we know so far, disturbances, they're not so seasonal. The Gazer community has known this for a while, but now we sort of have it all down on paper. This also has the consequence, consequence that something other than the changing cold water table causes disturbances, because if they're happening year round, we can't rely on that dropping water table hypothesis to explain disturbances. So we need a new mechanism. 
And then these disturbances have pretty distinct seismic signals, but kind of like how on the surface all of them proceed differently, no two are exactly alike in the seismic data either. So what I'm doing next with this project is trying to do a little bit more quantitative seismic analysis, figure out what those weird oscillating and gliding signals are, look into higher frequencies, not just the lower frequencies, and try to locate some of the sources. The other thing is we now have two seismometers in Norris Geyser Basin. We think there was a disturbance in January of this year, and we do see some weird signals on YNB, and it's lining up at the same time as we see different things going on at YNM. So good news, YNB is picking up something, and hopefully we'll get more where we have data from both seismometers. And with any luck, um, I'll be putting out some additional temperature sensors kind of as a pilot study for disturbance monitoring next field se season, so next month in April, assuming we have good weather. And that's all I have for you. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask. And make sure you tune in for our next presentation, which is going to be about figuring out what the heights of geysers actually are. And that's going to be presented by Ben Vanderlei on the 2nd of April, same time, 7 p.m. MDT. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. And I'm going to gulp down water. I think I have one to start you off, Mara. Uh, here is what do you what was in doing this entire project? What was kind of your most exciting find, or kind of that aha moment out of this project so far? Okay, so Will Will's asking about the most kind of exciting aha moment in this project. Let's see. Honestly, it really was plotting the seismic data, that kind of condensed version of it, where you just look at the strength of the seismic noise and then just actually seeing all those peaks. It's like, I already knew that it was there before even plotting the timing of the disturbances. It was just like, hey, it's, it's there. This seismometer obviously wasn't placed to catch disturbances and yet it is catching them and we actually have more data on what these things actually are. So that got me pretty excited about continuing down this line of research. Okay, Jake, any thought that earthquake-induced frequency step changes are permanently shifted, boiling chambers or changes in water levels and not rock walls? This one's complicated. So I didn't show it, but we did some additional seismic analysis, which you can do with different components of different seismometers or the same seismometer, is that you can use the ambient noise around the seismometer and you can cross correlate it and figure out if the material below the seismometer is changing in how fast it can allow seismic waves to travel through. So we did find that there was a decrease in seismic wave speed. So that usually corresponds to potentially cracks opening up or if cracks are already there, um, more boiling if they're already filled with water. So we do see that, but as far as we saw with this event, the changes were not permanent and things sort of settled back down to normal within a few days. Okay, this is a good question. If I could put a monitoring station of any kind anywhere in Yellowstone, what would I choose? Hmm. Okay, I have two answers. I would really love a seismometer smack dab in the middle of Geyser Hill. That would be great. The second is not really monitoring equipment, but there are really fancy, expensive, tens of thousands of dollars cameras that they use to 
put down geothermal wells. If we could get one of those, but a smaller version, it would make trying to image geysers directly a whole lot easier. So if somebody wants to give me several tens of thousands of dollars, great. Well, I have another question for you, uh, especially since we are uh, with our community here, and it, it looks like this has been a collaboration as well with the community. Uh, what is What are some of the biggest tips that the community can do to make sure sure that their observations or their data can help science and research. Okay. So what 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 can people do when they're like entering data to Geyser Times to be sort of useful to researchers? Is how I'm going to summarize that question. Um, So right, we all we all watch geysers for different reasons. We've all got interested in geysers for different reasons. So some people get really into data entering and some don't. I think that's totally fine. Um, I wish we as a community were better at sort of identifying things that we want to as a community like pay attention to and make more observations of. Like it would be lovely to just get more geysers at Norris, even if it's just, you know, for a walkabout and just writing some observations down about what you see and entering them to Geyser Times later. Um, I know, especially as Steamboat is winding down, a lot of people might might not find Norris as nice a place to be. The parking lot's always crazy. There's not a lot of large charismatic geysers there. But as I've gotten into this research, I've really kind of fallen in love with this basin and more geyser geysers should just go over there and just make observations. At least for this project, that would be one of the things that would really help. All right, thoughts about disturbances and other weird stuff going on on Geyser Hill. So the interesting thing about this latest event that we had on the hill in May 2023. Um, the University of Utah had a geophone out at that time placed near Doublet Pool because they were trying to do some longer term monitoring of the time between thumps. So we actually do have some seismic data from that. And that data analysis is ongoing. So I, as I, I guess, Short, unsatisfying answer is that I'm not sure yet if they're a similar type of mechanism, partly because we don't actually know what's going on at Norris, and we definitely don't really know what's going on with the hill. But just kind of the nature in which things evolved during that event, during the 2018 event, and comparing it to how things evolve in Norris disturbances, there are parallels from at least what you can see at the surface. So I'm really interested in digging more into that. One, I wish I wish they had more geophones out from different parts of the hill. We probably would have gotten gotten better information. But just digging into that data a little bit more, I'm hoping is going to tell us whether or not there are more similarities than differences. Okay, disturbances, seeing a clear pH change. Is there any reason to believe that cloudiness is a contaminant and not a precipitate project of changing composition and pH? So at least based on the geochemical studies that I know about, um, we're pretty sure it's just clay. So... It, Let's see, so the geology of Norris Geyser Basin is you've got the Lava Creek Tuff members B and A, but you've also got clay layers in between that. So this thermal system is sort of intersecting all of that. And if there's more violent boiling going down, that's more likely to dislodge that clay. 
So I guess if you want to call clay a contaminant, you could, but we're, we're pretty sure it's just the clay coming up. All right, you got 60 seconds to type any last questions. Oh, okay, we got one from Micah. Yeah, so this is kind of the same thing as uh, what was asked a little earlier. So it's it's been hypothesized that yes, maybe other basins go through disturbance-like events, and I think the events on Geyser Hill has been the strongest evidence that maybe there might be something similar going on in other geyser basins. Um, but Norris Geyser Basin is kind of unique in what clay layers it has. So it's like we have this very telltale sign that something weird is going on because suddenly you get a bunch of muddy springs. It's very visual. If you don't have those clay layers, like under the uh, upper geyser basin, at least kind of more towards the geyser hill layer, I don't think we have any clay layers down there. Um, so if something similar is going on, it's like you wouldn't have that visual cue. You would actually have to be doing some sort of geochemical monitoring to see if there's two different types of reservoirs mixing water or just something else is going on. You'd need to have more permanent monitoring equipment of some kind there as well to really get at that question. Well, so, so Jake, if you want to look at, um, more of kind of what we know about the subsurface geology. A lot of that information comes from the research wells that were drilled, I believe, in the 60s. That sounds roughly correct. So the 60s or 70s. And there's a lot of USGS reports that basically go through the results from that. And they have a log of all the different layers they encountered. So you can sort of look at the stratigraphy there in those reports. Yes, like the Carnegie drill hole. That's one of the ones in Norris, and I think that one was drilled earlier in the 20s or 30s. If I am getting this wrong, I can feel M.A. shaking her head from here. <laughs> All right, at this point, we will probably wrap it up. Um, if you have any more questions about what I talked about today or kind of anything tangential to that, I, I'm on Facebook. A lot of you have my email. There's the geyser listserv. You can contact me that way. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mara, for that wonderful presentation. It's quite interesting to see what, uh, what we've found out there the last couple of years. And so uh, with that, uh, just as a reminder, uh, we are actually taking a gap week here. So our next presentation is actually in two weeks. So some of our production crew is, uh, or in some people helping put us on are, are going to be traveling. So we're going to take a little break. Uh, so we'll have Ben Vanderlei on April 2nd on the next month. So at 7 p.m. Mountain. And we will see everyone there. And thank you again.